Hi there, uh, welcome to this meetup group uh, for GPDB. We have here today Shin, who worked on the query optimizer, and he's going to talk about what Orca, GPDB query optimizer is, and how you can go ahead and hacking query optimizer. So thank you, take it away. Thank you, Linky. Hi everyone, welcome both in person and also online. Over there. If you have comments, feel free to comment under the YouTube and we'll have people reading your comments in and we'll answer you after the presentation. We have a session for Q&A and uh, interactive sessions. Good. I even can make it a name for this presentation. I'm thinking, hey, this is a one-on-one -on -one class for anybody who wants to touch GPLCA and make some changes to it. So I call it GPLCA OSS one-on-one. Basically, um, the GPLCA project is done by the data team in Palo Alto. We open sourced in 2016 January. And uh, uh, the location for the open source is under the GitHub. And you can go there and find our original blog where we announced to the world the first, uh, so far still the only open source query optimizer. In this talk, we'll learn about what's the GPLCA architecture. I hope it's a uh, good information and why we use the GPL cloud, what's the pros and cons comparing to the existing planners, and also how we can contribute back to the GPL cloud. Hopefully at the end of the talk, you can get a repo, add a feature, test it, and then send a pull request and make this optimizer even better and benefit the entire community. What is GPL cloud? It actually stands for a green plum Oka. And what is Aka? Aka is basically just a name for this query optimizer. And we also give it multiple different names. In 2015, July, when we released the GPDB 4.3, we call it Pivotal Query Optimizer, PQO. And then in the paper, we just call it Aka in Sigma 2014. Later on, if you go to the code, you will see GPOPT everywhere, and somewhere you'll see GP underscore OPT, somewhere you will see the folder is GPOPT. They're all referring to the same thing, the okay. query optimizer. Because we couldn't trade market. <laughs> okay, outline of this talk, um, do some introduction, I'll show you the architecture. We'll do some dry run of the development, simulating, we try to modify uh, the optimizer. And I'll tell you how to do the stuff to get started on the build, the test, and debug it, and then see how we can contribute back. Here's the example. It's very simple, right? We try to find all the you know the beers actually in San Francisco. Um, in this case, we have two tables. We have bars and cells, and bars is distributed randomly, and cells is distributed by the bar. And you join those two things together, you try to find the bar, um, sign the beer in San Francisco. And when you have this query, when it's running inside a green plum cluster, exactly break it down into multiple slices. As you can see, if you do bottom up, we'll have the slice three, which is looking through all the bars when we filter out the city, which is San Francisco. And we redistribute the data on the join column, which is the name. On the other end, the slice two can run in parallel and scanning all the cells and then doing the hash join with the result redistributed above the bars and project it. At the end, on the master, we collect the data and we return back to the user. If you look at the, from the query execution point of view, the multiple slices actually have a multiple instances on different nodes. And in this case, you will see slice three, slice two actually running in parallel in one segment, and same thing for all the rest of the segments. And all these lines showing the data flows between the slices. And at the end, we have a gather motion, which is collecting all the data. Now the question is, how can we make sure the query optimizer is good enough, even under such complex class environment, we can get the best plan? GP Alka, we published a paper in Sigma 2014. One of the thing, or unique feature I feel like it, is GP Alka can optimize all the TPCDS queries. 
all of them. The surface area is very, very wide. And if you look underneath, you will see there are about 90 logical operators, 50 physical operators, 40 different scalar operators, and more than 110 transformation tools to really make it capable to optimize complex data analytics or data decision queries. Here are the few features uh, we see is better than the planner. The first thing is on the partition elimination, we do a better job. We add multi-level partition support, sub-query on nesting, this is crucial for some of the TPCTS query to really return. And common table expressions is very commonly used, join on possible data types, improve the join order, join aggregate reorder, sort order optimization, and we even can we do a skew aware optimization. Okay, let's take a look at the architecture of the GPL account. At the very beginning, when we design the GP archive, you can see GP archive is like a standalone library. It's designed to be able to be plugged in to any kind of host, any kind of host. And then it defines an XML interface here we call data exchange language to describe what I need in order to optimize. So they break down into XML format for the query, XML format for the metadata, including statistics, everything, and metadata, and XML format about the final plan we generated. So as long as the host can produce and consume those the XML format data, then it can interact with the GPLCAM, let the GPLCAM to optimize the query and execute it. So in this case, for example, for GPDB, we're using the parser from the host, parse the, parse the original SQL string, and translate it into the DXL format. So new to GPLK. During the optimization, we go through the metadata provider, talk to the host, grabbing all this metadata information. At the end, we produce the best plan, give it back to the executor, and execute, execute it. So by design, this one can be able to plug in any kind of host if they can provide these three uh, modules. If you look deeper in the TP Oka part, roughly it's split into two pieces. There is a layer we call GPOS, which is the green plum operating system in that case. It handles about the file IOs, exception handling, the concurrency controls, memory management, and then building on top of that, it's basically a drop scheduling uh, based optimizer. So everything is a job, and optimizer schedule this job. If all the job is finished, then we say we finish optimization, we pr produce a best plan. And all the context information about different prior plans is stored in the mammal data structure. I'll have an example to explain the mammal later in the slides. And there's a search framework to figure out what should I do in this huge space I just uh, stored. And in terms of optimization rules, there is a different operators we can try, logical, physical operators. There are different transformation rules to make equivalent query plans. There's cost model to help me figure out which one is better, which one is worse. Property enforcers is very interesting and unique if you want to make a query plan good for different kinds of hosts. Like in green plan, in this case, that's handling about how the data is distributed, how the data is sorted. And then the estimation model to figure out you know, how many rows actually in my base table. And then there's the metadata cache about the data types, what kind of operator we support, and so on and so forth. We'll go through those um, in details. In general, there is like five steps for Alka to optimize a query plan. Uh, we call it step zero. It's pre-processing. Basically, at this moment, we are not creating more search spaces. It's still the same plan. We massage this plan to a form where we think it's always, heuristically, it should be always better. For example, a predicate pushdown is happening in the pre-processing. Second is a step one, which we start to explore all the logical equivalent part of plans. That's dealing with the mammal, dealing with transformation rules. 
And step two here, basically we look at the prior plans we have and we start to acquire the statistics and compute how many cardinalities for, you know, for my join, for my table, for my index scan, so on and so forth. At step three, once we figure out uh, a good set of plans, we say let's convert them from logical to physical. In step four, we make this query plan more MPP friendly, massive parallel processing friendly. And uh, in this case, basically you look at distribution, what's the easiest way to distribute, what's the best cost to move the data around, and what's the overall costing for it. So if you look at everything before, like from step one, two, zero, one, two, three, you can think of this is a regular single node query optimizer. And the magic or the leap is basically happening in the last step to really make it an MPP friendly plan. Here is the example of the step one. Memo. Memo is actually a compact in-memory data structure to try to store a lot of query plans. Here is an example of a query plan. It's a logical expression. You have two tables, T1 and T2. And then we join them together on the condition T1 column A equivalent T2 column B. And then the T1 is on the left hand side and T2 is on the right hand side. So this is a query plan. When this one breaks down into memo, we break it into memo groups, and within each memo group, we have memo expressions. The definition of a group is basically saying, for all the expressions within this group, they are, should be semantic, semantically equivalent. Right. If they're semantically different, we'll break it down into separate groups. And here, we're indicating inner join depends on group one, and two. In turn, we know how we can construct the original plan out of the memo structure. I will show how this one is going to help to store a lot of plans. This is an example about transformation where we can produce semantically equivalent query plans. It's very simple transformation in this case. We have the original join comes in saying T1 is on the left, T2 is on the right, and this is the inner join. So we can apply a transformation rule saying, hey, I can change the order. The result will be the same. If without a memo, you're thinking I'm going to create two query plans, make a copy, and just change the expression order. In this case, we basically reuse the group one and group two. Only thing we add one more expression in the group zero and just switch the order, and that will produce a new plan. So MAMO is very good data structure to store a lot of query plans in a very good size of memory. And here, basically, we're presenting two logical expressions. Once we got all the transformation rules applied, MAMO will be crowded and populated with all possible semantically equivalent plans then the next thing I want to know is which one is actually better. Before I can make any judgment, I need to know how many rows we're dealing with. And that's the statistic derivation. In order to do it, basically there's a top-down request looking at the part plan saying, hey, in order to understand what do I need, what statistics information do I need? So from the top-down, look at the joins, and join saying, I need to figure out the join cardinalities. In order to do that, I need to know the statistics for A and also the statistics for B. Once the request goes down, once the request goes down, the GPL got talked to a metadata accessor, which is check whether we have enough information already retrieved in the metadata cache. If we don't, we'll talk to the host and retrieve those information. For example, when we optimize it down, because we have two expressions, we'll see, in this case, I'll check what's the status for A, what's the status for B, and then the first time I'll retrieve it, I'll store them in the cache. Next time I come to the second plan, I'll just say, hey, what's, is there anything better than this way? In this case, the method is already in the cache. We're not going to talk to the host again to retrieve the stats information, so we'll reuse it. 
once we got the statistics information, we do a bottom-up computations. In this case, we have group two saying, oh, this is my distribution of my column B, and this is distribution of my column A, and the join said, oh, this is how it looks together with the join calculator. After we have all the statistics, uh, we can do some basic pruning, and then the next thing is to understand, hey, this is only talking about a logical plan, right? We don't know how this inner join is implemented. It could be a nested loop, it could be a hash join, it could be a merge join. So there has to be a transformation from a logical operator to a physical operator. And that transformation is called implementation. So step three basically transforms a logical expression into one or more physical expressions. Like inner join can be translated into hash join, merge join, nest loop join, so on and so forth. Once we have that, we start to pick what's my best plan with my current distribution. And that is done by the MVP optimization through a property enforcement framework. The basic idea is I'll have sending a request top down to my query plan and saying, what, are, what is the cheapest way I can evaluate it, which is my result satisfy this kind of required properties? In this example, basically I'm saying there's two parts of property. One is called distribution property, the other is called order property. Distribution meaning at the end of execution, how my data will be distributed. Uh, we're looking at the end execution, everything should be on master, so it's a single time. The second one is talking about at the end execution, what kind of order I'm looking at. So in this case, basically saying I want the result to be ordered on T1.A. And this one will start to push down and doing the, the property derivation and costing. If we know this one is a hash join, then I know I want to have both tables hashed on the join column. In this case, basically I want to say T1 should be hashed on the column A and T2 should be hashed on the column B. In order to do that, basically propagate the requirements down because for this expression, I don't care how you get it, but if you can get it, that will be good. So basically, we pass the requirements down saying, hey, for scan T1, I want to hash T1A, I don't care about the order. Same thing for scan T2, I say I want to hash on T2.B, I don't care about the order. And you can see uh, the other results here. If the T1 distributed on T1.A, there's no further motion, which is meaning I'm going to move my rows around. No, fur no further mer motion is required. However, if the data is actually distributed in a different column, say T2 actually distributed on column C, and then I need to redistribute this one on the column B so that I can join them together, then there's extra cost of redistribution. Once we figure out the redistribution, there is a, and this one comes back, so we've got this part settled, this part settled, and we still have one more, which is regarding to the order, right? I want my result in T1.A. So in this case, for the T1.A, I can either do a sort of all the results on the T1.A, and then I do a merge with the order preserving gathering, or I can do a gathering, which I don't care about the order, and then I can sort at the very end. All these variations will be evaluated and costed, and the cheapest plan will be chosen and returned to the host. Okay, that's the overall description about how GPLCA works, what's the layer there, what's the roughly every step, what they do. And next one I'm going to talk about, hey, I want to, this is cool, I want to be part of it, I want to contribute, what should I do? With this one, we're going to walk through example. And in this example, we're trying to add a row, sorry, add a rule, a transformation rule, which is very common in the MDP environment saying, I want to do an aggregate. 
But in order to do this aggregate in the MTP environment, I need to split it into a local aggregate and a global aggregate. Here are the example saying I have a table full and three columns A, B, C, I distribute by A. And my query is saying I want to get a sum of C from the full, which is grouped by, by B. The general idea behind it is basically saying if we can do all the local aggregates on the segments, which is dramatically reduce the rows, and then we do the global aggregation on the master, then the speed will be optimal for this setting. In order to make that possible, we need to introduce a rule saying, if I see a credit plan like this, which is, this is a group by ATT operator by column B, and I get from table four, I want to aggregate with the sum of C. That is equivalent, semantically equivalent, I split the group by, I do a group by on B with the sum, I do another group by on B with the sum, which doesn't hurt. Even in a single node environment, it doesn't hurt. It's just redundant, but even in the MPP environment, you can make this one running on the segment and this one running on the master, and that will speed up the query dramatically. We say, okay, good, let's add a rule. Every rule in GPRCA is actually encapsulated in its own class. In this case, we'll introduce a new class called C transform split GBAGG, group by aggregate. And all the header files basically go under all called GBOPT include, and the sources is under SRC. In order to trigger the transformation, we need two parts. One part is I need to identify where am I going to trigger this transformation. That is the pattern matching part. So I give you a tree, I give you a plan, how do I know which part I'm going to apply this rule? The second part is like when am I going to trigger it? That's called precondition check. Here is an example. So the prior pattern is, looks like this. Basically we're saying this is the expression which is trying to represent a certain pattern like that. And I say I'm looking for a logical group by aggregate. That has to be the expression operator and look on the top at the root. Then I'm looking at this one should have one relational channel and one scalar uh, project list. In this case, this one, the C pattern tree for the scalar is representing the sum C, going to match the sum C, and this one, the expression for the pattern lib, going to match the get four. We have a question. Uh, I was asking how many types of aggregation we have and what is the difference? We can all this question actually ask that. Yeah. And I think it's good. Um, I can answer it now and then maybe we can part of the other question at the end of the presentation and we'll do that. Uh, so the question is how many times we can apply the aggregates? How, how many like, types of aggregation we have and what is the difference? Yeah, type of aggregation like a sum, average, standard deviation, as long as you have sure. a... We have stream max so, and hash max. So uh, the, the, the question is quite broad. Yeah. So yeah. A, you can have it as, if you see it just as a logical level, you can have the local aggregation, you can have intermediate aggregation, and you can have final aggregation. That's just... Uh, just in the abstract cases. sense. Sure. You can have different kinds of aggregate functions. Uh, he's asking for cases. So uh, then it is local logo. aggregation, intermediate aggregation, and final aggregation. But just to complete my thought, then you can have um, predefined aggregation like min max, mm -hmm. and then you can have user defined aggregation. Right. And then to just complete that, we can have stream aggregation. Um, or you can have hash aggregation. So those are physical hash uh, aggregation yeah. operators. But anyway, that. Yeah. Well, basically, the, yeah. the mm -hmm. aggregate function needs to support splitting. So the ordinary functions don't necessarily, ordinary user-defined functions don't necessarily support splitting. Um, but we can talk more about it at the end. Yeah. Like sum can be split, count can be split. Average can be split. 
but others may not be able to. If, if they use a different aggregate, which they don't provide so, that split. So you need to supply like, the optional function for us to understand how to split. All right. Thank you. Yeah. And then let's part the other question to the QA section. Yeah. Awesome. OK. So we talk about the pattern. If we only have the pattern, we only solve part of the problem. The other problem is when we're going to kick in this rule. If you look at the pattern, so here's the question about, if I already have a current plan split, what will happen in this case? Keep splitting. It will keep, keep splitting, because it will match this one, and it will split this one again. It will match this one, it will split it again. Then we have to have a condition saying, hey, I'm only going to apply this rule if certain conditions match. And that's the precondition check. In this case, we say, are my rule actually compatible? So if I know my result is not generated by myself, then I can apply. So this is basically saying, don't recursively infinitely doing the split. Yeah. Just to, just to add on, so basically at each step, we record who created this operator. So if uh, so if we if we, if this ag if it was already fired once, it'll say, hey, this was created by a spinning. Right. So we want to truncate that. Very nice. Thank you. And uh, after we do the matching, after this one passing the precondition check, then we actually call in the function to do the transformation. So all the details will be implemented in this function. It gives us three uh, parameters here. One is the context, like what's the optimization context. I'm going to use information from here. I'll update more information in the context. And this is what is my result at the very end. So if I have two way of doing the aggregate or if I have a two stage or three stage, whatever, the, the, all this thing will be generated. And this one is basically what's the input expression I'm going to apply my rule out. After we have the rule created, and that one has to be registered to the optimizer to make use of it. And the registration actually in another class called transformation factory. And just adding one more saying, I'm going to create this rule in my factory when it will be used later on. OK, let's take a look at the code base. If today you go to GitHub, you download the TPL class, and this will be the top level folder you're going to look at. CMake is where all our CMake information, because that way we use CMake to build our project. Comforts is our continuous integration pipeline information to always check the quality of the code. Data is where we store all the test data. And libgp, dbcar, libgpobt, libgpos, lib Narcrates? Narcrates. Narcrates? It's Greek. <laughs> uh, the core libraries, the GPO that depends on, I have more slides to describe details. The patch is where we have some few changes to um, GP Xerxes. Scripts and server is where we have our unit test. So if it from the bottom, uh, remember the architecture of the GPOS is on the bottom. So that's the lead GPOS. It's doing all this memory, task scheduling, exception handling, and even have our framework for the unit test. So if you look at the code, roughly under the XRC, it's very straightforward. Tell you this one giving the memory, this one giving the error, this one giving the task, this is the test, and then here you have the unit test under the include. Then you have this Nocrit, Nocris? Nocrates. Nocrates. <laughs> Remember the Excel where that is defining the interface between the host and the GPLCA? That is actually here. So you can find all the operators. We do the translation for the Excel, the parser, the XML is here. And then this one also contains the statistics. And uh, we have a bunch of ways to control the behavior of the optimizer. We, we call them Trisplex. So you can turn them on and off and controlling what rule are, what rule are, what information do I want to see, so on and so forth. 
On top of that is the ZDBLBD, which is actually our engine. It's doing the, uh, the search, it does the metadata, it metadata caching, all the memo data structures here, all the operators are defined here. For example, the walkthrough when we say the GPA group by ATG rule is going to be put somewhere here. So basically you can see this is breaking down into the engine, the metadata cache, the mini dump, which is a very interesting thing we can describe later on to how to use it to test the GPL cut. All the operators here, um, the search, the transformations. And then, how to say, GPL is very modularized. We actually separate the cost model out of the core engine is in the GPDB cost. And in that, you can plug in different kind of cost model, depends on your host. In this case, we have two version of the GPDB cost models, and then we even have another version where people can plug in their own configurations to configure their own cost model. Then we have the server, which has all the unit tests which is a very nice feature if you want to contribute back to the GPL account, you don't even have to try to run the GPDB. You can actually just compile the account and run it. And this one basically store all the DXL information we need, which is we can replay inside the optimizer. Uh, I think I have an example later on on the mini dumps. Okay, then data. So all the test data, uh, in the XML format, in the data exchange language, which is XML format, will be stored under the data folder. So that has, you know, the cost, the metadata, metadata uh, breakdown into different uh, transformation or scenarios, multi-level partitioning. Yeah. Okay. Now you get a you get a clone. You take a look at the structure. You'll understand it. So the first thing you're going to do is to build it. And building it is actually very, very simple. You need to get a CMake 3.0 plus, and then we need to have another dependency, which is GB Xerxes, to handle XML. And you can get from the GitHub location here. Once you build and install the GP Xerxes, and also install CMake, the rest of them is pretty simple. You just go to the repo, make a build directory, cmake dot dot, and make it. For, for the purpose of controlling the quality and make it visible, we actually have a pipeline, which is help you uh, to continuously build and run the test on top of that. So this one basically, we build a Xerxes, and we build Alka, and we publish it, or we build GPDB, we run test. Actually, we also test. ran test there. We ran test is running. We ran test there. there. That, that's actually the bulk of the time. Right. <laughs> the C test is actually running here, the unit test running here. And this is more on the integrated, once we integrate with the GPDB. Ah, talking about the test. <laughs> I, you know, you do anything, you touch it, you modify it, maybe you play with, play around with the rules, you don't know whether it's good or bad, so the thing you run is just the C test. You can run in parallel um, by giving a J parameter, so this one you can run in seven threads concurrently. Or, after running all of them, one of them failed, and this is basically telling you I can just run the one which is actually failed and verify. The entire thing finished in less than two minutes on this laptop. And the other thing, remember, uh, there's the integration test at the end of the pipeline. Um, thanks to Jesse here. <laughs> oh. uh, you can go to GitHub and go to this location, and actually you can run a GPDB in the Docker with the version of the GP Alka you're building and that will run through a bunch of IC install check good test to make sure it works well with the GPDB. Debug. Something will fail. Uh, then how can I figure out 
be optimistic. How can I figure out where to go? To right. Minutes. There are multiple things to help diagnostic the issue uh, before we, you know, trace down and find all the uh, root causes. One is um, the trisplag.h, which you can go there and see a lot of numbers like this: one zero one zero zero zero, one zero one zero zero one, so on and so forth. We're all changing the behavior of the GPR gram. And for the easiness to debug it or narrow down through the GPDB, most of them map to the GUG, the grand, grand unified configuration. So basically, in here you can say, I want to use GPR gram, set optimizer on, and I want to actually see the query, the input query where the ACA was seeing it. So you can turn this one on. And uh, when you run it, you will actually see the query input. And mini dump. Mini dump is one very powerful tool, I believe, as part of GPL And uh, as soon as you go, you, you get a handle of it, it's very, very useful. First thing is it can create a mini repro for you. Say, I have a query, it doesn't produce the plan I want, then what do you do? You either say, I'm always going to run through the GPDB, go through all the troubles, or you do all these commands, and then it will produce a little XML file for you. And that one will have all the metadata, all the input query, and even the output query for you. Then you can just run the mini dump directly by doing GPR with D pointing to that dump. And then you can just run it directly with your optimizer instead of always going through the host. This is more guts, which has helped you to find, uh, this is just saying I want the message to be on my client. I turn the optimizer on. I want to look at the input and output plan. Here is, remember the mammal? In the mammal, sometimes you have a lot of plans. And how do I know where the bug is? Is that a bug actually in, I didn't actually generate the plan? Or I do generate the plan, but it's not optimal, right? Then enumerating them and really see it is actually a way to verify, yes, I do generate it, and this is what it looks like. Um, and this one can even pick the prior plan in your search space for you. You may want to know more about I just write a new rule, transformation rule full, or transformation rule super optimization. And you want to know how good that thing is used. Do I actually call my rule or not? You can turn on the statistics and see how expensive is my rule, how many times that rule is actually called. And you can also debug into the transformation to say, hey, this is my input. I go through the transformation. This is my output. So it's a very useful set of GUGs. The other thing is actually print out the whole memo. Uh, and that sometimes is very a valuable information to pick in my search space and see, hey, is there anything wrong? And this one break it down into the stages. Remember we have the stage two, I think. Oh, stage one, exploration, and then the implementation where the logical becomes physical. And the last one, the optimization, the MVP, the final step. And if you want to find the root, root group, it doesn't have to be the first group, it doesn't have to be the last group, just searching for root. This is another very handy tool you can do through directly through GPDB, is to turn on and off certain transformation rules. It's very useful if you want to narrow down the scenario to see if that relates to my rule, or is actually um, unrelated. So you can quickly turn on off your new rule or the rule I just changed and see how that thing behaves. <laughs> this is very funny. One of the things in Optimizer is it's a scheduler-based uh, how to say process. Then it doesn't have a call stack, meaning if I apply rule one and then I apply rule two, then I apply rule three, you won't see a call stack saying one, two, three, right? In that case, then where should I set breakpoint to really stop it? Um, these are the critical points you can actually stop it on. This is entry point for the entire optimizer. 
This is where we do the translations from the Excel to the query. This is the pre-processing steps, including predicate pushdown, a lot of things. And here, two, three, and four. Oh, my number is a little bit different. Anyway, uh, all these optimizations are happening here. So for the transformation, the transformation rules are here. This is where we do the final step of property enforcement. And then this is the final step where we translate the execution plan back to the DXL and give it back to the host. It's about the chip required. Get that next time. Version next time. two. Version two. Version two. Yeah, they should have one hundred two or two hundred one. Right. Even today, say, hey, I want to contribute. Fantastic. What do you do? Go to the GitHub, download the GPAPA, look at the issues, and uh, or if you have an issue, you found an issue in the GPAPA in your environment, you can report in the issues, and then. Hopefully you can fix the issue and send the pull request to us. And this is the we have a mailing list, gpdb users, gpdb dash users plus subscribe at greenplum.org, which is using the same uh, mailing list. And um, thank you very much for using and that. listening. <laughs> That's pretty much it for the presentation. I think we are reaching the Q and A session. So. Oh, thank you. And actually, today for the people who join a little bit later, we I have a lot of people from Fire Optimizer team. They are very knowledgeable. What are they? <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, any questions? Is there any more questions online? No. Nope. Pretty quiet. So, quiet. one of the things which I, um, so all the debugging stuff right. that you had mentioned, uh, are, uh, are those knobs in the GPDB side or are those in Orca side? Right, most of the knobs I'm mentioning here, they're on the GPDB side. Okay. Yeah, so there are all the gucks on the GPDB. Which is help you to go to a point where I say, oh, good, I have a good red file. This is my mini dump. Also, oh, you are giving these as a hint to collect a mini dump, and right. then you can go in Oracle Land and play with it. Exactly. That will be the proper uh, process. Uh, I had a question. So the page where we do the status is derivation, right? Mm -hmm. So they, we see for a particular column, these are the histogram and what correct. So for instance, uh, uh, I had a table, there was a stat source for that in the cache, uh -huh. and someone truncated the table, reloaded the data, and now there are new set of stats which are there. Right. How does the metadata cache know that it has been changed, or for the ne next coming query, I should pull it up from up? I can answer a question. Good question. Uh, so Postgres has a, has a system called SysCache. Mm -hmm. And uh, in syscache, we can register callbacks and hooks, meaning that when certain events happen, we can customize what should happen. So one of the things is uh, we hook into syscache, and we will just prune the, we will ev evacuate the invalidated like cache entries. So what you're describing in the general case is how do we invalidate the cache? Right. So what we do is we hook into syscache so that we know when things change, we will just like evacuate the cache. Yeah. Okay. And and uh, truncating table is one of them. Inserting is another one. So. Using this right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Currently, any DDLs that happen, so say you added a column, dropped a column, then forget even about statistics, even the schema definition changed, right? So we need to drop that. So um, as Jesse said, we have a hook that for these commands, we just flush the cache out. It triggers the invalidated cache. It yeah. yeah. So currently we, this is one thing, currently we throw away all of the cache. So if someone wants to contribute yes. and fix it, we have not just <laughs> uh, wait, wait. <laughs> so, yeah. anyone wants to contribute, that's a good uh, first step. Yeah, cache invalidation is a very hard problem. Well, do we have any actually, uh, Place where people can actually know what they can contribute to. Like this one, as you said, is a good place for contribution. Mm -hmm. But if I want to so, contribute, but I don't know what I'm going to 
contribute to what I can do at the, at the moment. How can I get up to speed? If you're a database user and you feel some pain and you think, oh, I wonder if the optimizer can do that for me. Oh, they don't. Let me make that happen. So uh, eventually we are going to have an open tracker, uh, which is for public view. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not there yet. Uh, but up till then, um, we can report such issues. It's a very good point. We will report these issues on the issue list. We already have some. If you go to the GPDB side, um, uh, and even here can, we have issues. even we have one issue right yeah. now. Yeah. But if you go to the GPDB side, uh, let's walk this through. So before Maybe we have we open a, tracker, people can use um, GitHub issues as a proxy. Could we could we put it on the screen so we can. Um, so if you go here and right now, uh, if you just say uh, as, uh, uh, assign me to me, more. just go oh. to assign me to me. Like this? No, go up. Yeah, it will show in our tracker. Assign me. Right? VR. VR. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. So there are all of these things which are assigned to me for now. <laughs> uh, some of them are Orca issues that they have been reported on GPDB because that's the, one of the biggest consumer of Orca. Yeah. Um, that is a very good place to go start taking a stab at it. Um, does, it does, does, does anybody need to sign a contract or any legal document to contribute? Uh, uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Basically, you have to sell your firstborn. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> there is a corporate. There is a contribution license agreement. We also have a bot that checks whether you have signed it before. We will look at your code. So it's really easy. You you. It takes four clicks to agree to it. So. Any other questions? We can. We just won't merge it. Yeah, we can actually look at that rule uh, in the soul. This is maybe not large enough. Oh. Yeah. There we go. That's large. Right. We can look at the code a little bit if we want to go a little bit further. Right. Remember in the slide we say, hey, we add a rule. We actually have that rule here. <laughs> Uh, it's called split GBA AGG, right? And then if you look at it, this is the, um, the header file for this rule, which is like F compatible. So this one saying, hey, I'm not produced by myself. And also this is another one, distinct qualified aggregate. If I'm not produced by distinct qualified aggregate, then I can apply to this rule. And this is the transform the definition of transform, and then we'll go to the actual implementation of it. And let me think, is there anything else here? Um, OK, we can go to the class. Oops. Right. So this is actually um, on the slide where we have the expressions. The expression is actually here, which is exactly the same. So it's very easy to write a pattern if you get used to all these, ignore all these things, and then it's very easy to write a pattern of what the tree you want to match for. Uh, question. Yeah. Can you elaborate on this difference between this leaf and a tree? Right. That's See a very pattern. good question. Yeah. Um, so a uh, C pattern tree means that you are pulling, it's, it is, it's taking the project list, which is all of your aggregates. So it's going to pull the whole tree up. Um, a leaf meaning you could have an arbitrarily large subtree, but you don't care about it. You're going to pretend it's a leaf node. So the C pattern leaf will just get the root of it, get the root. and C pattern tree will get the whole tree underneath it. Right. Because when you're going to split your aggregate, you need to know what is that. It could be sum of A plus B or sum of A minus B, or it could be count of distinct. So there is an arbitrarily long um, tree there. So you need to get all of that because you need to split it. Right. I actually have no idea what's happening here. <laughs> no, like we, we make some pattern here. Great. Yes. But what happens? So what happens is that when you, so this says that, oh, Whenever you touch, when you go into a, what this is trying to tell you is to say, 
if you go and in memo you touch a group expression that has a logical operator logical ag and it has two two nodes or mm -hmm. like a leaf and tree mm -hmm. ignore what it is it says then what i want you to do is to trigger this and the input of the transformation will be get the whole scalar tree out and get me that top of the relational chart. Mm -hmm. So that's the pattern it's trying to tell you right. to the transform thing. So once you register this transformation, at each, it, the, basically how the transformation works, it goes through the memo for each group, it looks at the operator and says, hey, what can I apply on you? Mm -hmm. And then it says, it says, oh, I can apply, you're a group by, so I can apply the split group by. Okay, does it match? So it tries to check the pattern and then says, oh, I'm going to get the whole scalar tree and I'm going to get the root of the leaf. So, Right. And I add on that, uh, that going to the implementation of the transform, right? So this expression is where we match the pattern. And once we handle this one, we know, once we see PXPR, I know the operator uh, from this expression has to be the logical group by aggregate has to be because that's the one I matched up. And then you're going down, you'll say my first child is whatever that relation operator is. And then my second child is a scalar, right? In the pattern I say this is a scalar, which is my projection mask. So based on that pattern, I know how I can extract the information I need. Then we start to do the massage. Remember we want to split it. So in here, basically we say, we want to split the projection list into local part and the global part. And uh, I'm just skimming through it. And then basically I want, this is all the column references and everything. And you just go down here. I construct a local aggregate expression, which is using uh, still a logical group by aggregate. And I have my uh, children, which is a relation, and I have my local protection list. And then I construct a global aggregate, and it's also a logical group by. And in here I say my children is actually the local I just created, and then I have my global protection list. So in this way, basically, one input of, of one group by aggregate is split into two group by aggregate. And then at the end, we say the result actually has this one as a result yeah and a transform can have multiple results correct so correct. if you want to take a look at that you please look at splitting dqa yes um so x forum split dqa and make it bigger and here in the transformations this is we say first alternatives i put in the result and then keep moving on, and I have second alternative, I put in the result. And then we have third alternatives, I put in the result. And eventually, all these different transformations will be costed and evaluated and see which one is the best one. So uh, what is what, what I find amazing uh, working in Orca is everything is when you're trying to add a, a transformation, you're only looking at adding a transformation. The engine will take care of costing, the engine will take care of statistics, the engine will take care of when to apply it, whom to apply it, all of those things. You just up focus on writing the transformation, writing the patterns that you want to look at. And if you're, if you're going to go add a pre-processing step, all you need to focus on is writing a pre-processing step. Mm -hmm. Rather than, there is no global state that we maintain everything is compartmentalized so you can focus on contributing in a very small area so mm -hmm. it does not look like this mammoth code base um, so that is very good for contributing especially if you don't want to deal with understanding the whole optimizer mm -hmm. so I would encourage uh, just to go to these two examples uh, and tinkering with this uh, transformation mm -hmm. um, and see what happens. That's a very good starting point. That's a question for those who would like to contribute. Are there some documents which gives us more details about it, except what you mentioned uh, earlier in your presentation? 
and uh, like the the coding standard here appears to be following a different nomenclature. Is there any guidelines which you suggest for? So uh, the coding standards is a suggestion. It is not a rule. Uh, if contributors can definitely follow their own, and whenever so all pull request all code changes go through pull request. We'll definitely encourage to keep some consistency, but that is not a hindrance for contributing. Right. And Wait, it is. If you touch a file, make sure your code looks like the surrounding lines. But uh, if you don't, we will uh, comment on the pull request. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> right. For the people who want to know more about the ARCA, we mentioned one paper, right? Um, but to understand like mini DOM, to understand certain rules we write, there are different papers published. So in the slide deck, actually, there are a lot more papers to give you more background. And also including like the mini dump ideas, like how we can test it. They're all published in certain papers, so that will help people understand the design, the reasoning behind it. So in addition, there is a there is also a blog. This actually brings up a good question um, uh, to do for us. Uh, we wrote a blog post of how to profiling Orca. Um, that's in the Pivotal blog. So all of these we can actually put it up in the GitHub uh, as yeah. links that people can go access. Um, I think you also pointed out that what we're missing here is um, we didn't quite publish like a contributing guy like a lot of other more popular projects. So as we get more and more attention, we'll just like I, I think we'll just be more ready for that. So we'll probably just publish more of those like in the coming days, months, years. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't like making promises. <laughs> Commitment. So. Great. Good. Did anyone like?